Hello, Fulcrum Knights and those who are yet to join the Order. Welcome back to a new edition of the audiobook of Star Wars Slave Ship by K.W. Jetta. This is the second book of the Bounty Hunter Wars, and I apologise for the gap. Um, I also apologise for any audio differences that you experience this episode. I do have a new computer up and running so I can produce these videos for you. However, I'm not back to my original setup, so things will be a bit different. As part of that, I'm not going to be able to do the usual effects that I would do. So the nice little helmet sort of speaker voice for Boba Fett and things. This is just because I'm trying to get something out for you guys who've been waiting very patiently. And I really appreciate that uh, for this next episode. Um, this is going to mostly just be, I think, a single chapter. This is a very long one. And it is the return of our good friend, Kadar Mabat. Uh, so my friends, I hope you enjoy and hopefully we'll be back to our normal running schedule and quality next week. But for now, we have Chapter 5, which takes place just after the events of Star Wars A New Hope. I've never been here before, said the emissary from the Bounty Hunters Guild, though of course it's been described to me many times. How flattering it is to be the auditory recipient of such notice. Kadar Mabat folded another pair of his chitinous, spiked-haired legs around himself. To be spoken of in the corridors and nooks of the galaxy's intrigues and powers. Such a pleasure, always. The compound lenses of the arachnoid assembler's eyes watched in amusement as the guild's emissary tried to keep from actually touching any of the web's fibrous and living structure. Silly creature, thought Kadama Bat. The amusement it felt was easily concealed behind its own narrow, triangular face. That was one of the advantages the Assembler had over the members of nearly all the galaxy's sentient species. It could read them as easily as a primitive ink and paper data sheet, while its own emotions and calculations remained a massed enigma to them. Kadama Bat supposed that was why he always enjoyed dealing with the bounty hunter Boba Fett. With that visored mask on, the helmet of the Mandalorian armor he bore, Fett was a constant challenge to decipher and manipulate. A worthy opponent, mused the assembler. Even if he was already fated to lose, enmeshed in a larger, invisible and inescapable web. You'll have to excuse me if I seem a little... uncomfortable. The emissary's name was Gleed Ottenden. His host couldn't tell from what miserably harsh outlying world he had originated, but it was obviously one that produced impressively bulky and well-equipped residents at the top of its food chain. The emissary was all leather-encased muscles, with a horn-spiked skull and proboscis atop. His clawed hands twitched against his knees as he overwhelmed the guest chair near Kadama Bat's throne-like nest, he glanced again at the densely intertwined fibres arching over his head. Are you sure this place is airtight? My dear and most precious Gleed, allay your fears. If outright laughter had been in the repertoire of the assembler's emotional responses, Kadama Bat might not have been able to restrain itself. Reasonable as those apprehensions might be, I assure you that they are most unnecessary. Perhaps even a little insulting, though the assembler kept that reaction to itself. It signalled to one of its corporeal maintenance subnodes, a miniature version of its own spidery form. The wave of an upraised leg tip was actually unnecessary. The little node was tethered to the assembler's own central nervous system, as were all the living bits and pieces of the web, the partially differentiated inhabitants that Kadama Bat had spun from his own innermost being. But I'll check, just to be sure, for my most esteemed visitor. Gleed Ottenden shrank back, as though trying to hide inside his own body armour 
as the summoned node scuttled past his shoulders, trailing a whitely glistening filament of neural connector tissue behind itself. The node perched alertly on the angle of Kadama Bat's outstretched leg. Thus, thus, the node was all eagerness. It had been one of the assembler's favourite creations, though the bouncy mannerisms were starting to wear thin now. What can I do, do, do for you? And the echoing whole word stutter in its vocal circuits was definitely annoying. Kadama Bat made a personal mental note in the unshared segment of its own cerebral cortex to eliminate that flaw with the subnode's successor after this one had been re-ingested. Anything at all, all! The curved walls of the web's central chamber seemed to move and shift, all of the gathered subnodes turning the varying levels of their communal consciousness toward the discussion taking place in their midst. A general alert had gone out over the web's neural fibres as to just how important these meetings were. Underneath a few dangling nodes, Gleed Ottenden cringed at the sight of the bustling, enveloping activity. A status report, please! Kadama Bat made a show of giving orders to the subnode clinging to its extended leg. That was all for their visitors' benefit as well. There was no real need for courtesies being extended to the things that were as much a part of the assembler as its own segmented abdomen and thorax. Regarding our dear little home's atmospheric pressure, is all as it should be, pray tell? The subnode was silent for a few seconds as it shifted its minimal nervous system into communication with the rest of the web's bioengineering and homeostasis maintenance nodes. Their wordless back-and-forth conference evoked a tingling sensation inside the tactile processes of Kadama Bat's central cortex. For a moment, it could feel the interlaced network of the web's outer sheath, as though its soft abdomen body had expanded to the limits of its sensory perceptions. Drifting amid the star's cold points of light, the web's rope-like strands were studded with functioning scraps of various machines and spacecraft. Those bits and pieces were the only ones that the assembler hadn't spun itself, but had incorporated into its extended being, usually as the final payments due from one extortionate scheme or another. The foreclosed-upon debtors were usually expelled through one of the web's annular exit ports to deal with the vacuum as best they could. Kadama Bat's interest in them ceased at that point. The assembler thought it morbidly uncouth to collect scraps of corpses as trophies, the way those reptilian Trandoshans did. Normal pressure loss experienced. At Kadama Bat's direction, one of the skittering voice box subnodes took over from its exterior maintenance web cousin, still sitting on their parent's spider-jointed leg. The stutterless voice box dangled within inches of Gleed Ottenden's head. The emissary regarded it with evident dismay. During reception of visitors in transfer from docking vessels, atmospheric generation stepped up two levels over the subsequent time period, per standing orders for perimeter breach procedures. The voice box node fell silent for a few seconds, as it received more data from the exterior sensors. The voice box nodes were little more than articulating mouths and embedded vocal cords. They didn't possess enough separate memory to hold more than a few sentences at a time. Internal web pressure currently at 95% of optimum volume, 100% uh, optimum within next hour. There, you see? Kadama Bat gestured with its extended leg. The assembler spoke rapidly to keep its visitor from thinking about and commenting upon the one word, vessels, in the plural, that the voice box node had let slip. That's the problem, thought Kadama Bat, when you don't give your underlings enough brains to think with. Nothing to worry at all, he said out loud. If you say so. 
The emissary from the Bounty Hunters Guild looked only slightly reassured. The real worries, as always, belonged to Kadama Bat. Life itself, mused the assembler, is a burden. It was a constant temptation to design and create the web subnodes with enough cortical matter to render them capable of independent thought and action. That would have taken a great deal of the load off the assembler's multiple shoulders. It might also, Kadama Bat reminded himself, take my head off those shoulders. The web had come to Kadama Bat as its inheritance upon the death murder, actually, of the arachnoid assembler that had spawned it. That might have been right and proper. Kadama Bat had never felt any guilt over the matter, but at the same time, it had no intention of making the same mistake itself as its creator had. Ah, but I do say so. Kadama Bat enacted a semblance of a gracious humanoid bow, spreading wide two of its jointed legs and bending forward, eye-studded head lowered. The shifting of the assembler's weight momentarily lifted its pallid, wobbling abdomen from the living nest beneath. The concave subnode sighed and put its minimal intelligence to the task of reinflating its cushion-like bladder parts. I make every effort for the comfort of my so highly esteemed guests such as yourself. Even if it did not facilitate the flowing conduct of business, I would still feel it incumbent upon me to do so, honored as I am by your presence. Don't bother. The emissary's unease shifted to annoyance. With a visible display of will, Gleed Ottenden regained control of himself. I've been informed about all your flattering language. His eyes narrowed into a focus of distrust. It won't work on me. Ah, thought Kadama back to himself, keeping his satisfaction hidden. But it already has, one way or another. I'm sure, soothed Kadama Bat, that you don't mean that in a hostile way. But... Of course, if you wanted to, that would be fine with me as well. I'd try to be accommodating as I hope you've seen. The assembler settled back down into the nest subnode's soft embrace. May I prevail upon you for a very small, inconsequential kindness? If you'll excuse me for a moment, I must confer with a few of my tiny minions. Trifles, mere details, such an annoyance. None of Kadama Bat's multiple eyes had lids, but a slight opacity filmed over their bright, head-like surfaces as the assembler relaxed their focus. It tucked its legs around itself as a further indication of having withdrawn its attention. One of its tiniest creations, an optical subnode barely bigger than a humanoid thumb, peered out from behind a tangle of the web's structural fibres. An unsheathed neural strand, white as spider silk, conveyed a sharp image of the guild emissary to the parent assembler's cortex. Gleed Ottenden looked grumpy and uncomfortable, obviously irritated by even the slightest delay in taking care of business. Let him stew for a while, decided Kadama Bat. The assembler's full consciousness had already siphoned off along the connecting neural fibres to another part of the web, and to another visitor. You look different, said the Trandoshan bounty hunter, from the last time I was here at the web. Ah, my dear and most esteemed Bosk, the web's owner and creator, the arachnoid assembler, Kadama Bat traced a gesture with one of its upraised legs, signifying a galaxy's worth of hard-won wisdom and regret. You are still in the prime of a vigorous youthfulness, is that not so? Whereas, myself... The points of the tiny claws at the end of the leg tapped against a chitinous segment of exoskeleton carapace, just beneath the assembler's triangular face 
and where a heart would have been if its anatomy were closer to humanoid or reptilian. I grow old and tired, just as your beloved father Kratos did. May his memory be enshrined among the stars. Yeah, well, the old lizard isn't going to get any older now, that's for sure. A glow of satisfaction kindled in Bosk's own scale-covered breast. His father's bones, gnawed and picked clean, rested in Bosk's trophy chamber, where he could gloat and meditate over them any time he wished. Served him right, thought Bosk grinding his fangs together as though retasting the memories of his predecessor. With Trandoshans, death was the penalty, not just for getting old and tired, but for getting in the way of the next generation. Bosk, specifically. If his father Kradosk hadn't tried to hold on so tightly to the leadership of the Bounty Hunters Guild, things might have not gone so gruesomely for him. Or perhaps they might have. Recycling the protein and other constituents of one's elders was such a time-honoured tradition among their species it would have seemed a shame not to have carried it on, even if Kradosk had graciously surrendered the guild's leadership to his heir, Bosk. He was a tough old lizard, mused Bosk aloud. His tongue traced the broken point of one of his own fangs. In a lot of ways. Deep is the measure of my own reminiscing, said the assembler. When I recall your father, Kradosk, many were the dealings I had with him. Much business did we do together, and most of it was highly and mutually profitable, I assure you. Believe me, I know all about that. Bosk folded his arms across his chest. His elbow nudged one of his holstered blaster pistols. I was in on a lot of that business. The profitable stuff. And the unprofitable. Ah, uh, what can I say? Two of Kadama Bat's legs lifted in an approximation of a shrug. It's a dangerous galaxy in which we live. Poor struggling creatures that we are. Not everything works out as planned, does it? That's the truth, brooded Bosk. He had long harboured the notion, more than that, a cherished dream, that when he took over the Bounty Hunter's Guild from his father's faltering claws, he would inherit a powerful and united organisation, one that he would be able to rebuild into the dominant semi-legal force among all the inhabited worlds. It could have been bigger than the great criminal syndicate Black Sun, inasmuch as the guild had the ability to operate on both sides of the Empire's laws. Criminal overlords, such as Jabba the Hutt, hired bounty hunters, as did Emperor Palpatine, by way of his various underlings. In that sense, bounty hunters had always operated as sanctioned lawbreakers, to the degree that their clients either didn't care about or turned a blind eye to whatever methods were being used to bring in the merchandise. Just as long as the job gets done, thought Bosk. It was a sweet arrangement, or had been. The Trandoshan's musings turned bitter. Real sweet, Bosk nodded slowly. Until Boba Fett screwed it up. Not for himself, but for the Bounty Hunters Guild. And worst of all, for me. You seem pensive, commented Kadama Bat, nesting across from where Bosk sat. And so unfortunately melancholy. How that grieves me. Perhaps it would be better if we let the past be the past and let go of those thorny memories that impinge upon the tender flesh of our bosoms. Easy for you to say, growled Bosk. As far as he could tell, nothing was poking at the assembler's globular abdomen hard enough to draw blood, whereas he could just about taste his own filling his mouth. It was in Kadama Bat's nature to have profited from the debacle that had befallen the Bounty Hunters Guild. 
Bosk wasn't exactly sure how the assembler might have gained from it, but he was sure that it had happened. No wonder the spidery creature could be so gracious. It was doing all right, as it always had. But for himself and the guild... Properly speaking, it wasn't even the Bounty Hunter's Guild. Not any more, at least. That was more of Boba Fett's doing. The tragic result of having let him into the Guild in the first place. A perfect example of how senile old Krados had gotten. For him to have fallen for that gambit. Bosk had been suspicious of Boba Fett's intentions from the beginning, and his suspicions had turned out to be accurate. The outcome of Fett's joining the Bounty Hunters Guild had been to split the organisation into two, neither one of them as powerful as the original, and both factions locked in combat with each other. One faction, the True Guild as it called itself, was led by the elders that had been the original guild's governing council behind Bosk's father Krados. The other faction was primarily made up of the younger guild members, who had chafed for so long underneath the increasingly slow and inept leadership of the old Bounty Hunters Guild, and who had seized upon the internecine turmoil created by Boba Fett as their chance to break away and form a new organisation. Bosk had thrown his lot in with the latter group, the Guild Reform Committee. It was a committee in name only. Group leadership had ceased upon the Trandoshan's assumption of its chairman position. Now it was more of an efficient and brutal one-creature dictatorship. The exact image of what he had always intended the original Bounty Hunters Guild would become when his father Krados died. And it will be, Bosk had vowed. There was no room in the galaxy for two rival Bounty Hunter organisations, one of them would have to be exterminated. When that was taken care of, and Bosk had already set into motion his plans for accomplishing that particular task, then the committee would resume the name of Bounty Hunter's Guild, the one and only. He had already removed a few personal obstacles to his control of the committee. If the bodies of some of the younger Bounty Hunters turned up in deliberately conspicuous places, it only served to illustrate the consequences of objecting to Bosk's one creature, top of the food chain, management style. And if some, well, quite a number actually, of the Guild Reforms Committee rank and file decided that it was safer to go over to the old, stodgy, true guild, then Bosk considered it no great loss to his organisation, or to his plans. Who needs them? Bosk had long ago decided that it would be better to have fewer bounty hunters on his side, as long as they were also the tougher and more bloodthirsty and credit-hungry ones. That had been the problem with the old Bounty Hunters Guild, one that he wasn't going to repeat when he had finished his campaign to take over and install himself as the head of what should have been his rightful inheritance all along. There had been just too many bounty hunters in the original guild. Sheer numbers had kept the individual profits down, as well as making the whole organisation slow and inefficient. It was small wonder that a private, non-guild operator such as Boba Fett had been able to steal all their action. And even less of a wonder that when Fett had applied for membership in the Bounty Hunters Guild, and had been accepted by that fool Krados and his council of advisers, he had been able to split the organisation into fragments in hardly any time at all. Those other guild members, brooded Bosk, they just weren't up to Boba Fett's speed. They had fallen for Boba Fett's smooth line of talk, all that business about what the future was going to be like and how they all had to work together, and they had suffered the consequences. The old Bounty Hunters Guild had been the only place where some or even most of those types had been able to survive, and without it, they were dead meat. There weren't many out of the number that had gone over to the true guild faction that Bosk wasn't going to let back into the reconstituated Bounty Hunters Guild. He had other plans for them, and their names on a list that he kept securely locked inside his head. Before it was all done, there would be quite a few corpses showing up in places where the right creatures would find out about them. 
Some might get dumped in the unlit doorway of the Moss Isley Cantina, back on that hole of a planet Tatooine. The silent bodies of one-time bounty hunters would serve as an effective message to all concerned that Bosk was in business and in charge of that business. All the galaxy's creatures, whether they were underlings of Emperor Palpatine or criminals in league with Black Sun, Hutties independent operators or members of the Rebel Alliance, if they wanted to do business with the Bounty Hunters Guild, they would have to deal with Bosk and on his terms. And those terms would be rough for them, all of them and sweet and profitable for Bosk. He had already decided that. But right now, he had other business to take care of. With an internal push of will, Bosk ended his idle but pleasant imaginings. Time enough later, he thought, for all that. After his own plans and schemes had come to glorious fulfilment, there would be a lot of bones added to Bosk's memory chamber including those of his arch-rival Boba Fett. That severed skull would be a particularly fine trophy, encased in its dark visored helmet of a Mandalorian armour. But right now, if all those plans were to bear fruit, Bosk had to attend to his present business, no matter how unpleasant the surroundings, and repellent the creature to whom he had to speak. Kadama Bat's high-pitched voice cut through the last fragments of the Trandoshan's reverie. Please, spoke the assembler, consider yourself under no unseemly obligation to hurry. At least do not do so for my benefit. As your humble servant, I wait upon your convenience. Yeah, right. Bosk focused his slit-pupiled gaze on the arachnoid squatting across from him its spidery legs tucked around the pale globe of its abdomen. He was already wondering if there was some way to include Kodama Bat in his plans, so that the assembler's hollowed-out exoskeleton wound up among his other trophies. Kodama Bat watched and approved. The assembler's most trusted creation, the accountant's subnode named Balance Sheet, was doing a good job of handling the Trandoshan bounty hunter Bosk. Balance Sheet took care of so many things now. The subnode's responsibilities had expanded far beyond those for which Kadama Bat had designed it. Simple number crunching and tracking the ebb and flow of credits in the web's coffers, Kadama Bat should have known from the beginning, when he had just spun Balance Sheet's essential brain matter from the assembler's own neurocortex, that the subnode would eventually turn out this way. It's just like me, thought Kadama Bat, with an unavoidable trace of parental pride. Cold and calculating and so nicely devious. Deviousness was called for. When one had twice as many visitors to the web and twice as much business to conduct as a single entity could take care of, even as versatile and multitasking a creature as the arachnoid assembler had its limits. Plus, there were additional difficulties with this particular pair of visitors. Much trouble would ensue if either one found out that Kadama Bat was engaged in talks with the other. Gleed Ottenden was here representing the interests of the True Guild, the loyalist faction of the now splintered Bounty Hunters Guild, and Bosk. Bosk represents himself, thought Kadama Bat with an inward, appreciative smile. Any other claim was a useful fiction, both for the Trandoshan and any other creature doing business with him. The Guild Reform Committee's members might have been fooled, but Kadama Bat wasn't. Bosk was an ambitious and ruthless individual, much as his father Krados had been before advancing age had rendered the elder Trandoshan slow and gullible, and dead at the claws of his own offspring. Using the neural feed from the optical subnode perched in one of the web's smaller chambers, Kadama Bat viewed Bosk and itself. The latter was also a useful fiction, though Bosk certainly wasn't aware of it. Some time ago, years or even decades of standard time units, the assembler had shed its external carapace, but 
hadn't discarded the hollow replica of itself. Kadama Bat had decided there might be other uses for the empty exoskeleton, and had even spun out from itself enough neurofiber and simple muscular tissue to turn its former shell into a controllable likeness of its own physical form. The masquerade was completed when the clever accountant subnode, Balance Sheet, proved itself capable of crawling inside the shell, linking up to the neurofibers' synaptic receptor points and performing a passable imitation of its creator, the original Kadama Bat. Right down to my ornate language, Kadama Bat had judged. Such an apt pupil. The assembler's own calculating nature was tinged for a moment with a warming emotional glow, a phenomenon otherwise unknown to him. The simulated Kadama bat, the carapace with the sub-node balance sheet inside, made its excuses to the grumbling Trandoshan. A moment later, the real Kadama bat felt the tickle of the sub-node's consciousness, like a tug on the neurofiber connecting them. Well done! Kadama Bat directed its own thoughts toward the subnode. You have this bounty hunter completely deceived. Balance Sheet responded with appropriate and becoming modesty. Your praise is unearned. It was easy. He wishes to believe the things he hears. My speaking is but your words in another mouth. But nevertheless, performed with meritorious acuity. Kadama Bat had never lavished such words or thoughts on any of his other subnodes. That would have been like praising one of the compound eyes in the inverted triangle of its head, or one of its multi-jointed legs, or any other mere part of itself. For that was all the subnodes were, mere created extensions of the assembler's self. To make such statements about the little accountant subnode only indicated how different Balance Sheet was from the others in the web, and how much Kadama Bat had come to depend upon it. Another emotion, that of anticipated regret, welled up inside Kadama Bat's chitin-mantled breast. I'll miss it when it's gone. That thought was carefully kept from the subnode. Kadama Bat had no intention of letting Balance Sheet discover the fate planned for it. The assembler had already decided that the accountant subnode's days were numbered. No matter how useful and important it had become, the mere fact that Balance Sheet had evolved and taken on such importance, becoming Kadama Bat's most valuable creation, sealed its doom. Balance Sheet already had developed more intelligence and independent volition than all of the web's other subnodes combined. That was why it could handle such a task as imitating Kadama Bat, from inside the otherwise empty carapace. In the far reaches of Kadama Bat's memory, before it had become the galaxy's leading fixer, arranger, and go-between for the various world's criminal and semi-criminal elements, it could remember having become just as valuable for the affairs of its predecessor, the arachnoid assembler that had spawned it as a mere subnode. That predecessor had wound up making the mistake that Kadama Bat had sworn not to repeat, that of letting one of its creations become too intelligent and independent. However valuable and convenient such a node's services might be, they weren't worth the price of eventual rebellion, mutiny, and murder. Patricide might be in the natural order of things for some species, an inevitable segment of the passage from one generation to the next. That was the way it was for Trandoshans, like Bosk, from all reports. Whether it was the same for assemblers such as itself, Kadama Bat had no idea. The only other member of its species that Kadama Bat had known had been the one that had created it, and that it had murdered and consumed in turn. Those acts had seemed natural enough, or at least easy and satisfying. When Kadama Bat had done them, sometimes though, in the web's dark and silent drifting between stars, in those brief intervals when there was no business to be conducted, the assembler allowed itself to wonder if it might be the exception, an aberration from the natural order. Perhaps its millennia-old predecessor had grown old and tired, 
and had created and groomed its chosen successor with an innate capacity to rebel, kill, consume and usurp. Perhaps it hadn't been rebellion so much as fulfilment. The notion didn't bother Kadama Bat, in fact, it gave the assembler a little glimmer of hope. Deep inside itself, perhaps Kadama Bat could trust the little accountant subnote named Balance Sheet, no matter how smart and independent it had evolved to be. Perhaps Kadama Bat wouldn't have to destroy this most precious and worthy of all its creations, ingest its matter, and spin out a new bookkeeping subnode. But one that could never replace dear little balance sheet. Kadama Bat pushed those thoughts away, as it had done so many times before. I can't allow it. Thoughts such as those were not the cold and precise calculations by which it had reached its present position of real, if hidden, power and influence. Kadama Bat knew that any emotions, even those directed towards its most faithful subnodes, constituted a trap. A trap with Kadama Bat's own death loaded into the catch of its spring. Better it than me, Kadama Bat already decided. Even though the assembler was connected by neural strands to all the web subnodes, it didn't consider the whole lot of them to be identical with its own precious self. With the viewpoint from the dangling optical node, Kadama Bat regarded its own shed exoskeleton. The smaller form of balance sheet, like a miniature version of its creator, was just barely visible. If one knew to look, behind the glossy transparency of the carapace's compound eyes. How sad, thought Kadama Bat. With intelligence came deceit. It was ever thus, Kadama Bat supposed, inside the web and throughout that larger galaxy beyond it. Nevertheless, the resolve to eliminate the accountant's subnode had to be delayed, at least for a little while. Necessarily so, and not out of mere weakening sentiment. At this stage, in the complicated plans regarding Boba Fett and the remnants of the former Bounty Hunters Guild, the assistance of Little Balance Sheet was still required. Kadama Bat knew the dangers of the game it was playing. When the pawns on the game board were like the Trandoshan Bosk, the results of one's deceptive manoeuvres being found out were inevitably fatal. And in the most unpleasant manner possible. Bosk didn't yet know, and Kadama Bat was determined that he never would, that Boba Fett wasn't the only creature involved in the breakup of the old Bounty Hunters Guild. The scheme hadn't originated with Kadama Bat either, but had been brought to the assembler by that veritable eminence among the plotters and double dealers, Prince Zizor. The Farleen noble was an altogether different type of creature from the so easily hoodwinked Bosk. Both Farleens and Trandoshans were reptilian species and equally cold-blooded. But a hot-tempered streak diluted the chill of Trandoshan blood. Given the choice between successful scheming and disastrous violence, a creature such as Bosk would always go for the latter option. With Prince Zizor, as with all Farleens, nothing raised the temperature of his moods. The emotions that ran hot in other creatures, whether lust or other violence, were merely tools of Zizor's precise and merciless mind. That was what Kadama Bat appreciated the most about doing business with him. When Zizor had been here at the web, laying out the scheme against the Bounty Hunters Guild, Kadama Bat had perceived more than a mere business associate in the Farleen. Zizor, at least, was a worthy opponent on the other side of the game board. This one, however. This one, however. Another thought leaked into Kadama Bat's central cortex. A moment passed before the assembler realized the thought wasn't its own. This one, came Balanchit's unspoken words is too easy. Another moment, as Kadama Bat recovered from its surprise. The accountant subnode's thoughts had broken into Kadama Bat's own, entirely unbidden. That had never happened before. 
and it had been in response to Kodama Bat's interior musings about the differences between Trandoshans and Farleens. Those thoughts, the contrast between Bosk and Prince Zizor, had not been directed out along the web's neural pathways toward the subnode hidden inside Kodama Bat's discarded exoskeleton. It was listening, thought Kodama Bat. To me! And then... Kadama Bat was unable to keep from wondering if the subnode had heard that thought as well. Kadama Bat stilled all its thoughts, creating a perfect silence inside itself. For a few moments, all it did was wait and watch, letting the image from the optical node fill the momentary vacuum of its consciousness. What would you have me do now? Balance Sheet had spoken again the words forming inside Kadama Bat's cortex as real as the assembler's own thoughts. Across from the sheltering carapace, the bounty hunter Bosk sat in the web chamber, unaware of the silent conversation taking place. Only a few seconds had passed since the accountant's subnode, pretending to be Kadama Bat, had made its excuses to the bounty hunter Bosk. Given the impatient nature of all Trandoshans, it was probably not a good idea to make him wait much longer. Kadama Bat regained enough of his internal composure to address the waiting balance sheet. Proceed with the negotiations, spoke Kadama Bat along the neural fibres connecting him to the subnode. The Trandoshans' confidence has obviously been gained due to the excellence of your masquerade performance. Kadama Bat kept the tone of its thoughts carefully unemotional and controlled, suppressing any kind of anxiety or suspicion on its part. If that is easy for you, so much the better. The subnode's response held the same apparent lack of emotion. As you wish, thought Balance Sheet, and as you so wisely instructed me. For a few seconds longer, Kadama Bat watched via the optical node in the smallest chamber as the disguised balance sheet resumed its cajoling flattery of the Trandoshan Bosk. The assembler kept its own thoughts hidden, disconnected from the strands that might have conveyed them to the accountant subnode or any other that Kadama Bat had created. Its resolve, that it had already made regarding the fate of balance sheet, was even stronger now. As soon as this business with the Bounty Hunters Guild is over, Kadama Bat assured itself. Definitely. The assembler allowed its consciousness to flow back from the extended neural fibres of its web and recondense in its own body. Kadama Bat was once again aware of the main web chamber surrounding itself where it had left Gleed Ottenden, the true guild's emissary, waiting. Better safe than sorry. It's about time. Gleed Ottenden grumbled as the assembler raised its head and blinked its multiple eyes. I don't have endless standard time units to waste on this matter. An infinity of apologies, my most profound regrets. Kadama Bat rearranged itself into the gently sighing, accommodating nest. The assembler performed another imitation of a humanoid bow lowering the narrow triangle of its head before the visitor. Farthest from my mind is any wish to seem other than entirely honoured by your presence. Believe me. Let's just try to wrap this up. The assembler's flowery language produced a sour expression on Ottenden's sharply angled muzzle. There's really only one basic issue that needs to be settled, and it's a simple one. Are you with us or not? Pardon? Kadama Bat spread wide two of its front legs. What is the precise meaning of with? I don't mean to imply that your words are not of pristine clarity, but... Stow it. Gleed Ottenden's irritation was obvious. You know what the score is. There are two factions that came out of the Bounty Hunters Guild, and there's only gonna be one left eventually and the true guild plans on making sure it's the one that survives. But of course, said Kadama Bat, with a semblance of a smile on its triangular face. Survival is such a lovely virtue. 
I've practiced it throughout the course of my existence. Then you'll want to go on practicing it, I bet. Gleed Ottenden leaned forward, his hard glare reflected in the assembler's multiple eyes. And the best way to do that is to make sure you're on our side. The true guild isn't going to feel very friendly toward anyone who didn't help it put the bounty hunter's guild back together again. Those renegades in that so-called guild reform committee. They're dead meat. And that's what will happen to anybody else who gets too cozy with them. Ottenden turned his head to one side, peering more closely at the assembler across from him. Just how cozy are you with Bosk and that bunch of his? My dear Gleed! With its upraised forelegs, Kadama Bat made a fluttering gesture. I understand the appropriate nature of your inquiry, but I am a trifle shocked by it nevertheless. Suspicion is all very fine in your trade. It's certainly a necessity. But I've never been suspected of being an idiot. I do know how things work in this galaxy. Well, I thought you might. Ottenden's smile was made even uglier with its suggestion of brotherly conspiracy. You really aren't an idiot, are you? But you very well might be. Kadama Bat kept his response unspoken. I have not reached the advanced age and influential position that I possess by making poor choices as to friends and alliances. The assembler tapped the claws at the ends of its forelegs together. So you and the others in the true guild, and of course, I regret not having the opportunity and pleasure to address each and every one of them directly, may rest in the utmost assurance that I am, as you say, with them in this regard. And while the bonds of friendship and the great admiration I have for such eminent and respected bounty hunters as the members of the true guild would naturally dictate such a response on my part, I would like to ease and reassure your mind even further. It's good business as well, my dear Gleed. The assembler refolded its legs around its cushion-cradled abdomen. Business that I wish to continue carrying out in the future, as mutually profitable as it has been in the past. Well, I don't know about mutual, grumbled the true guild's emissary. It's always seemed to put more credits in your coffers than in ours. How grievously wounded I am to hear you say such a thing. Kadama Bat let himself sink down into the soft embrace of its nest, the better to indicate its mortification. Perhaps at that happy time to come, when the upstarts have been so righteously and inevitably vanquished as the original bounty hunter's guild has been restored in all its glory, then we can go over our account books together and come to a financial reconciliation. The assembler's voice became even more soothing. If you yourself were to feel that you had suffered some personal hardship, you and I could talk about it. Privately, yes? Ottenden scratched his elongated chin. Are you talking bribery? Oh, that's such a crude word, don't you think? Kadama Bat shook its head. I prefer to regard such practices as merely a matter of making our friendship, the one between just you and me, even more satisfying than it has been already. And, of course, as a matter of friendship, if you were to return to the other members of the true guild, whose interests you so ably represent and you were to assure them of the avidity with which I wish to maintain business interests with them. Yeah, yeah, I understand what you're getting at. Ottenden gave a slow nod. But I'm not going to do anything like that if it isn't true. The bit about you wanting to stay hooked up with the true guild, and not having anything to do with Bosk and that guild reform committee bunch. But, my dear Gleed, that is the truth. 
the assembler lifted one of its forelegs into the air with a dramatic flourish. I swear it, absolutely and unconditionally. Kadama Bat tucked the leg back with the others around itself. That's not the sort of thing about which I'd even be capable of prevaricating. Would better be true, said Ottenden grimly. Because it wouldn't be worth my life to tell the other True Guild members that you're with us, and then have them find out that you handed us a line. A kind of bounty hunters doesn't reward stupidity. Too bad for you, thought Kadama Bat wryly. The Assembler's visitor would have done well for himself if that had been the case. Rest assured, my most precious gleed, that the relationship between myself and the True Guild and the Bounty Hunters Guild, when it has once again come into existence, will be one of exclusivity and mutual profitability. You have my word on it. Good. Ottenden gave a satisfied nod. You know... I kind of felt all along that we'd be able to do business together. Fool. This was the easiest sort of negotiation, telling someone exactly what they wanted to hear. Part of Kadama Bat wished that they could all be this easy, and, in fact, most of them were. It was only when the arachnoid assembler was matching wits with creatures such as Prince Zizor or Boba Fett that the game became both dangerous and interesting. That was what the other part of Kodama Bat appreciated, what made its own existence worthwhile. The Assembler had lived for a long time in the drifting web that it had inherited from its murdered predecessor. Kodama Bat had been putting together complicated deals and intricate, self-serving schemes before any of the creatures it now encountered had been born. When that much time passes, the search for a worthy opponent becomes an obsession. That was why it had been inevitable that Kadama Bat would have let itself become involved in the scheme to break up the Bounty Hunters Guild. Not so much for the profits that would accrue to the Assembler's coffers, though the credits would in fact be substantial, but for the thrill of the game and the quality of the opponents. Kadama Bat had been able to see past Prince Zizor, who had brought the scheme here to the web and laid it out before the Assembler's multiple eyes, all the way to Emperor Palpatine, so far away on the planet Coruscant, strings as delicate and intricately connected as any in the web were being pulled, and not all of them were in Zizor's hands. The Farleen noble enjoyed playing dangerous games as well, Zizor hadn't risen to the top of the galaxy-spanning crime syndicate Black Sun without having a taste for risk and the skills to pull off those kinds of gambits. Kadamabat was well aware of how deeply Lord Vader, the Emperor's black-robed fist, loathed and distrusted Zizor. The Farleen only had to make one wrong move and every suspicion that Vader had planted in Palpatine's thoughts would be confirmed. Fatally so for Zizor. When you play those kinds of games, mused Kadama Bat, for those kinds of stakes, you can't complain about what happens when you lose. In the minuscule heart inside its carapace, Kadama Bat felt sorry for the little accountant subnode balance sheet. It had never played at that level, never developed those kinds of sharp, hard gaming skills. If Balance Sheet had some notion of mutiny against its creator, as Kadama Bat had rebelled against its predecessor, it also had little idea of what it was risking. It might never know. The game and its existence would be over before it realised. Such thoughts were pleasing, but there was a business to be concluded. Kadama Bat turned its attention back to the true guild emissary sitting before it, I'm sure your time is valuable, my dear Gleed. The assembler swept two of its legs out before itself. Much more so than mine, which is only well spent when it's given to wait upon visitors such as yourself. Uh, with that in mind, are we at last in perfect agreement and harmony? 
The interests of you and the other true guild members are identical to my own, as far as I'm concerned. They may not be identical, said Gleed Ottenden, but I guess they're close enough for now. Ah, so wisely put. I'll trust you have no problem going back to your fellow True Guild bounty hunters and assuring them that their friend and business associate, Kadar Mabat, is indeed, as you say, with them? Maybe, Ottenden shrugged. There'd be even less problem if we settled that other business as well. You know, the bit about the bribe. That unpleasant word again. From deep inside the feathery mandibles of its exhalation apertures, Kadama Bat sighed. But I do know what you're referring to. After all, I brought the matter up. A little more delicately, though. Avarice showed in Gleed Ottenden's smile. If we could work it out right now, so that there were some tangible evidence along those lines. Well, then I think we'd really be rolling. Got it? Oh, yes, but of course. With one claw tip, Kadama Bat scratched the lowest point of its triangular face. The emissary's request for a transfer of credits from the web's coffers into his pocket actually raised some difficulties for the assembler. Its accountant subnode, Balance Sheet, usually handled all those kinds of financial details, but right now... Balance Sheet was busy impersonating Kadama Bat from inside the Assembler's discarded exoskeleton. The Trandoshan bounty hunter Bosk was unaware that the actual Kadama Bat had been in simultaneous negotiations all along with one of Bosk's enemies from the True Guild. And Kadama Bat had no intention of ending the masquerade. To do so would send both Bosk and Gleed Ottenden into murderous rages not directed at each other, but first at Kadam Bat. Actually, said the assembler, after a moment of silence, I'm very embarrassed, inasmuch as I cannot presently fulfil your eminently reasonable request. What? Gleed Ottenden barked a harsh, sceptical laugh. <laughs> you gotta be joking. Everybody knows you're stuffed with credits out here. After all the business you've done, you must be sitting on piles of them. Sadly, that is not the case. Kadama Bat gave a slow shake of its head. Around him, the assembler's various subnodes gathered closer, like piteous orphans seeking shelter from cold storm winds. Their various eyes turned toward Ottenden's face, not all of my business ventures turn out so well, as do those where I have joined my feeble abilities with those of your profession. That is why I am so eager to renew the bonds of mutually profitable loyalty between myself and the true heirs of the Bounty Hunters Guild's mantle. There are so many untrustworthy and devious creatures in the galaxy, and I am but a humble go-between, a mere arranger of business between various parties. And I am so easily cheated out of what is rightfully due to me. The assembler dabbed at a few of its bead-like eyes with a claw tip though moist displays of emotion were physiologically impossible for it. And I have so many expenses. The tip of the claw pointed to the clustering subnodes. Really, the upkeep on this place, it's practically more a medical than a business expense. Spare me. The true guild emissary gazed at the arachnoid creature with disgust. You want to plead poverty, take up somebody else's time. Ossenden began fastening the brass hooks of its outer cloak. I don't want to hear it, but don't forget. He stood up from where he had been sitting, then menacingly leaned over the assembler. You owe me. A debt of honour, squeaked Kadama Bat, drawing back from Ossenden's jabbing forefinger. Every standard time unit will begin with my recall of exactly this matter. 
Yeah, my bet. With his massive shoulders almost scraping the chamber's curved, fibrous walls, Ottenden looked around himself. How do I get out of here? I've got to get back to the guild. They'll be waiting for me. Kadama Bat let one of the internal guidance subnodes scurry away and lead Ottenden to the web's main docking area. There was another, smaller dock on the other side of the web. That was where the Trandoshan bounty hunter, Bosk's ship, Hound's Tooth, was moored, safely out of Gleed Ottenden's view. When Bosk had contacted Kadama Bat about coming out to the web to have their business discussions together, the assembler had convinced him that there was a need for secrecy. Powerful forces hinted at, but not named, were watching the web and keeping track of its visitors' comings and goings. That had been enough to convince Bosk to go along with the approach and docking arrangements that had kept him unaware of the true guild emissaries entering the web at the same time. Gleed Ottenden had been similarly hoodwinked, and just as easily. Without leaving its nest in the web's main chamber, Kadama Bat reconnected with the neural input from the optical node he'd used just a little while before. The deeply suspicious face of the Trandoshan Bosk immediately came into view, just as clear as if the assembler had been in the other chamber with him, instead of the disguised accountant subnode, Balance Sheet. What's that? Bosk turned his head, listening to some distant sound. Over the elongated strand of silken neurofibre that connected them, Kadama Bat directed the optical node to refocus so that the assembler's discarded exoskeleton could be seen as well. Pardon? A voice identical to Kadama Bat's spoke from inside the carapace. The accountant subnode balance sheet spread two of the exoskeleton's forelegs apart in a gesture of bafflement. To what do you refer? What I heard just now. The nostrils on Bosk's scale-covered snout flared wider, as though he could breathe in some tell-tale molecules from the web's recycled atmosphere. Sounded like a ship taking off. In the vacuum of space, outside the drifting web, the rush of low-power docking engines from Gleed Ottenden's ship would have been inaudible but enough vibrations from the disengagement of the docking subnodes had travelled through the structural fibres of the web's exterior for Bosk's sensitive hearing to have picked up. A smaller tremor, one of apprehension, moved inside Kadama Bat's chitinous body. If balance sheet inside the assembler's shed carapace bobbled its response, then Bosk might very well leap to the conclusion, accurate enough, that the web had had another visitor while he had been here. Yes, it did sound like that, didn't it? All of Kadama Bat's spidery legs clenched around its nest as it heard the distant subnode's words. But, continued Balance Sheet's voice, of course it wasn't. How could it be? In the view from the optical node, dangling from the ceiling of the smaller chamber, Bosk's slit-eyed glance turned toward the carapace of the balance sheet inside. You tell me, said Bosk, just why it wasn't a ship leaving here. It's simple enough, said balance sheet mildly. My dear Bosk, the only reason any sentient creature comes to my humble web is to conduct business with me and very grateful I am for their visits. But you see me before you right now, don't you? And for all this time that we've been together, and that I have enjoyed to such a degree, is that not so? I couldn't very well have been discussing business affairs with any other creature, as you've had my undivided attention all the while. A set of the exoskeleton's shoulders lifted in a parody of a humanoid shrug. So why would anyone else have been here? Really, I don't delude myself that my home has charm sufficient to attract guests for any other reason. Bosk's eyes squinted even narrower, signalling deep disgust. The scales of his brow tightened as the brain behind them scrabbled at the problem. So, what was it then? Merely the waste disposal function here aboard my web. 
the balance sheet steered carapace slowly shook its head. How embarrassing to talk of such things, rude plumbing and all, but I have the same housekeeping dilemmas as any other vessel that moves through such empty space as that surrounding us. Some certain waste products must be jettisoned for hygiene's sake. It's best to expel them with sufficient velocity to leave the navigational zone around oneself free of, uh, shall we say, distasteful impediments. The carapace's triangular face, a replica of Kadamabat's own, displayed a slight smile. Really, my dear Bosk, even the ships of Palpatine's Imperial Navy do very much the same thing. Oh, yeah, Bosk slowly nodded. I guess you're right. Not really, thought Kadama Bat to itself, though the assembler admired the fabrication it had just heard the accountant Subno deliver. The truth was that the web completely recycled its constituent matter. Kadama Bat had an instinctive aversion to letting go of any particle, no matter how small or insignificant, that had ever entered the web's living construct. To do so would have been like losing a piece of the assembler's own body. But, it admitted, as long as this Trandoshan is fooled, the truth hardly matters. When Boscad finally departed the web, the hound's tooth released from the docking subnodes a safe interval of time after the other ship's disembarking kadama bat complimented its creation on the quick and sure handling of the bounty hunter's suspicions well done said kadama bat secure in the embrace of its pneumatic nest the assembler let the accountant subnode perch on the claw tip of one raised foreleg in the distant and smaller chamber the shed exoskeleton was once again a hollow likeness of the assembler's physical form. You handled the Trandoshan in a way to inspire pride amid the internal organs of your creator. Merely a matter of business, Balance Sheet displayed no embarrassment at receiving such praise. If I show a facility in that regard, it is because all interactions between sentient creatures can be reduced to a matter of credits, expenditures, and debits. One of the accountant's subnodes' limbs traced the outline of a zero in the air. Sum and divide. And divide and conquer. Though, of course, conquest was rhetoric a little grander than absolutely necessary. Kadama Bat was perfectly satisfied with a higher-than-average rate of profit. That's always the best advice. Kadama Bat let the accountant subnode scuttle back into its usual resting place, deep in the internal corridors of the web. If the assembler wasn't careful, its rudimentary heart might soften once again toward the smaller replica of itself. Much had been accomplished with the subnode's assistance. The Trandoshan bounty hunter boss had gone away, convinced of the same thing that his opponent, Gleed Ottenden, was, that Kadama Bat and all its devious scheming was allied to the interests of his fragment of the old bounty hunter's guild. Let them go on believing that, thought Kadama Bat. When they found out otherwise, it would be too late for them to do anything about it. Whether the True Guild or the Guild Reform Committee won their battle with each other, that mattered little, as long as Kadama Bat won. The Assembler folded its legs around itself and meditated over what the next steps in its scheming should be. And there we have Chapter 6 come to a close. Uh, sorry, Chapter 5 come to a close. We'll be moving on to Chapter 6 in our next episode. Um, very long one. Uh, as I mentioned, really big, long one. Uh, setting up some of the bigger plots in this and saying hi to Kadama Bat. Reminding ourselves of the strange nature of the Assembler and the dangers it has from the creations it makes of its own body. A fascinating piece of Star Wars. A really interesting sci-fi idea. I always love to see Kadama Bat. However, I will say that I think, again, this author sometimes reminds us of things too often. Because he'll remind us of something he told us a couple of pages ago. And maybe that's just because the author knows, like, yeah, this is a real long chapter. I am very sorry that this episode has not included any shout-outs, anything to say hi to you guys, um, or to 
read your comments. Please do, though, keep commenting. I love to hear what you guys have to say. I just wanted to try and get an episode out for you guys as fast as I could since you've had such a delay. And again, I really appreciate how much everyone's waited. Thank you for being so patient. I really hope you enjoy this new video. Um, I want to return to the Red Dwarf books as well, so we can finish that one off. Um, and I am looking forward to seeing all of you guys in our live streams. We did a brand new one last Friday that was really, really fun. It was called Fulcrum Entertainment's What If? And it's where we take what if scenarios and we talk our way through what happens. Uh, myself, my co-host Gilbert, and uh, my partner Rue had a fantastic time talking about a crossover between the DC Extended Universe so their cinematic and TV exploits, and the MCU, to see what sort of stories we could create out of that. And we had a great time. We'll be doing one again soon, so keep an eye out, and this one will be Star Wars themed, asking the question, what if Obi-Wan was killed by Darth Maul instead of Qui-Gon Jinn? And our regular streams are continuing as well. So join us on a Saturday at 5.30pm Eastern, 2.30pm uh, Mountain, or if you're in the UK, 9.30pm uh, for our regular podcast, the Fulcrum Entertainment Podcast. And join us on Sundays at 5pm uh, British time. I believe it is, oh, I've forgotten it already. 12pm Eastern, 10am Mountain, and 9am Pacific. Okay, guys, I will look forward to seeing you in the next one. Remember, my friends, we are all Fulcrum. And if you haven't subscribed and clicked like, please do so. We really appreciate it. See you later.